Good afternoon. Today we'll be talking about force and torque sensors. Uh, this is lecture five, so uh, one reminder, next week is week six and there will be the test on the lab classes. So the questions are posted in the Moodle and uh, me and my colleagues will randomly select questions from this list. The test is done on the lab classes, not on the lecture and it's done on the beginning of the lab class. Okay, so uh, we'll be talking about force and torque sensors. Uh, there are many ways how you can measure force and torque. Uh, I will be talking only about one sensor, which will be a strain gauge. Uh, when we are using strain gauges, we do not measure force directly but uh, we measure the effect of force on something. Uh, so we will measure deformation and uh, this something, this object that is being deformed will be called a load cell. Uh, in some cases you can place the strain gauges directly on the object. We will also be discussing how to do this. Um, if you want to build something like weighting application, then you will have to use a load cell. Uh, a strain gauge is the most common type of sensor for force, but it's not the only one. There are many other types, but we'll discuss only a strain gauge. Uh, a strain gauge can be either from metal or from semiconductor. We will discuss the properties in a few minutes. Uh, the metallic strain gauge looks like this. So here uh, we have the strain gauge. It's placed on some backing material and uh, the sensitive area is what you see here, this grey tracks and uh, the strain gauge measures only in one direction when it's built like this. So uh, we will have to place the strain gauge in such a way that it measures what we want. So for example, uh, if we have a beam, then uh, if I place the strain gauge on the top of the beam and we will apply the force shown here, the strain gauge on the top will measure tension. If I would place that on the bottom, it would measure compression. And based on the force that we want, we have to place the sensor correctly. We will also see that it's possible to combine the several strain gauges to have a better sensitivity. So strain gauges are either, either metallic strain gauges or semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, we will discuss mostly metallic strain gauges because they are the most common type of strain gauge and uh, they also have many advantages compared to the other ones. Uh, on the other hand, the semiconductor strain gauges are also available. They will have some advantages, but as we will see, they will have also many disadvantages. So then, uh, at the end of this chapter, I will uh, tell you how to select the strain gauge based on some criteria that you will have for the application. Uh, the metallic strain gauge can be either from a wire or from a foil. It works in both cases in the same way. The only difference is how the, the strain gauge is manufactured. Uh, today almost all strain gauges are foil strain gauges because uh, it's easy to produce them uh, with the same technology like printed circuit boards for electronic circuits. So we will spend most of the time discussing metallic strain gauges. Uh, the wire or the foil strain gauge works in the following way. Uh, we have a sensitive material, that's what you see here in black, and this sensitive material is um, made from constantan. Constantan is uh, quite a good material for strain gauges because it's, it's not changing that much its properties with temperature. We will see in a, in a few minutes. Here the strain gauge is placed on a backing material which can be either paper or a plastic material, typically it's a capton tape. 
and uh, when you buy a strain gauge, it uh, looks like this. So this is a strain gauge itself. This is the resistive track where we will measure the strain. Uh, and we have some terminals where we connect the strain gauge to a circuit. It's uh, typically placed on uh, a tape like this, so you can easily apply the strain gauge uh, on your object. And uh, then uh, the strain gauges are typically glued with special glues to the surface. I have some examples here of uh, foil strain gauges. Just a testing sample, it looks like this. So those strain gauges are glued on this metallic sheet. You see the, how the terminals are connected. And uh, it works in the same way even if the strain gauge is made from wire. So if it's a wire strain gauge, the only difference is that this resistive track is made from wire. The material is the same, it's constantan. This strain gauge, as you see it here, measures strain in only one direction. So we want that we have maximum sensitivity in this direction. That's where we will mount the strain gauge. Uh, but in many applications, we need to measure strain in multiple directions. And uh, we want a device that is doing this directly. This device is called a strain gauge rosette. And it combines two, three or more strain gauges on the same backing material. So for example, here you see a strain gauge rosette with two strain gauges, uh, angle 90 degrees. Here you see a strain gauge rosette with three strain gauges, the angle is 60 degrees. Um, those strain gauge rosettes, they allow us to measure the direction of uh, an unknown stress. Maybe you know from other topics that uh, if you measure the direction well, measure the strains in three independent directions with angle of 120 degrees, then you may calculate the main stresses and their directions. So this is what a strain gauge rosette is for. You can see different types. Uh, this strain gauge rosette, you see it also over here, is uh, used to measure residual stress after heat treatment. So if you have an object, you make some heat treatment of the surface, then uh, typically we have some residual stress that remains in the object after this treatment. So if you want to measure it, you can uh, install a strain gauge rosette on the surface, you can glue it, and then uh, you mill a small hole in the middle of the rosette. This releases the stress and you can measure it. Of course, you make a small notch in the object, but uh, you have the information about the stress. I'll be talking more about the applications at the end. So, uh, how does a strain gauge work? Uh, we are using the fact that electrical resistance is uh, changing with dimensions. So, if you imagine uh, we have a strain gauge that looks like this, Initially, force is zero. We have some length of the foil or of the wire. Uh, we have some cross-section, and we know what is the material. So the electrical resistance is simply calculated by this formula. This is resistivity, cross-section, and length. If I apply force to the strain gauge, let's say it will be tension, I will increase the length of the strain gauge, and uh, I will change the resistance. So there will be some very small change of length. Th this this uh, change is really very small. It's like typically a few micrometers. Uh, and uh, this will have an effect on uh, the electrical resistance, which you see here. Of course, if I make something longer, I will decrease the cross-section. So there will be also a smaller cross-section in this case. It will also have an effect on the resistance. And uh, additionally, there, there will be also an effect on resistivity. So all those three will vary 
with the applied force. The same will happen if I apply compression. I will make it shorter but thicker and I will change electrical resistance. So we will look for the dependence between electric resistance and strain. Usually uh, we are not looking for this dependence directly because we are not interested in measuring the initial resistance of the strain gauge. We don't need that. We just want to get this dependence. So how much is the electrical resistance changing if I apply strain? So if you look on this formula, now we will need all three components uh, and we will calculate some partial derivatives. So uh, I'm looking for a dependence between change of electrical resistance versus strain. Now if I uh, take the initial formula here, I can calculate partial derivatives of the resistance over resistivity, over cross-section and over uh, this is uh, length, cross-section and resistivity. And the partial derivatives, they look like this. So you see that the change of resistance depends on the change of length, change of cross-section and change of resistivity. And all those three will be variable. Uh, we can substitute in this formula those individual components. Uh, we can simplify the equation because uh, there is a relation between cross-section and length. So uh, this relation is defined by the Poisson's ratio and uh, this is for technical materials uh, somewhere in the range between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5. For example, uh, for steel, it's roughly 0 0.3, aluminium 0 0.33, rubber 0 0.5. So we know what is the relation between cross-section and length, and we can use this in our calculation. So we'll, we'll use this formula. And instead of using change of cross-section, we will use just the change of length, because this dl over l is the strain that we are applying to the strain gauge. So when you do all this, uh, you will find out that uh, the change of resistance depends on the resistivity, it depends on strain, and this is uh, the Poisson's ratio, which is defined by the material. Uh, the formula looks relatively complicated, but all that we need to remember is this part. It is saying that uh, the change of electrical resistance is constant times strain. This is true for metallic materials. Metallic materials, uh, they have uh, this part of the equation that's the most important, that's the biggest one. And uh, it means that uh, for metallic materials, the properties or resistance change with pure geometry. It means uh, that we are changing dimensions and dimensions have an effect on resistance. For semiconductors, this term is the biggest one and it's called piezo-resistivity. It means that also the resistivity of the material is changing when you apply strain. So for semiconductor materials, we have this part, the piezo-resistive part is the biggest part, and we of course have also the geometry part. But for uh, metallic materials, we have only this part. For semiconductor materials, we have both. The re result will be that uh, if you use a semiconductor strain gauge, we will have a non-linear change between strain and resistance. That will be one of the disadvantages of uh, semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, this is also the reason why we are using, in most cases, metallic strain gauges, because here the dependence is linear. The constant K is called the gauge factor, and uh, it, in fact, describes sensitivity. How much is the resistance changing if I apply some strain? 
Now let's take a look on some materials that may come into question for strain gauges. We have already discussed platinum. Platinum has a gauge factor of about 6. So it would look like this is a good material, but uh, we know that platinum has uh, a relatively large temperature coefficient of resistance. So this is the reason why we are using it as a temperature sensor. So we will not use platinum for strain gauges because uh, it would work like a temperature sensor and not like a strain gauge. We need a material that has minimal dependence on temperature, which is constantan. Constantan is an alloy of copper and nickel. We have already seen that about two weeks ago for thermocouples. And constantan has a gauge factor of about 2.1. So, uh, foil and wire strain gauges made from constantan will have the gauge factor equal roughly to 2. You can see there are also other alloys like nichrom, karma and, and so on that are used in strain gauges as well. Uh, they have a similar gauge factor. So we can say that the gauge factor for metallic strain gauges is approximately 2. In all cases you need to look on the packaging of a strain gauge and you need to find uh, the gauge factor for this for certain batch. So for example here uh, I have uh, a semicolon a wire strain gauge row Z and uh, they say it has a gauge factor of uh, 1.9 so it's roughly the value of 2. It is changing a little bit batch by batch so uh, you need to, to look into the manual. If you look on the other materials for example nickel just by looking on this you would think that this is also a good material it has sensitivity of minus 12. Minus means that uh, it is uh, decreasing electrical resistance with applied strain. Uh, but uh, for just from this value, we don't see how this dependence looks like. So uh, this is it. Uh, here we have strain. For nickel, initially, the electrical resistance is getting smaller. This is why we have the negative sign, but then it is positive. But the uh, main reason why nickel is not used for strain gauges is that this dependence is nonlinear. So we are not using nickel. If you look on different materials, like for example constantan, you see that this is a nice linear dependence and that's the reason why constantan is used for strain gauges. We can use different alloys as well. You see here the ferry alloy, it's not in the table, but it's a similar alloy like constantan. Uh, or you could also use uh, an alloy of platinum and rhodium. You see here uh, it has a higher sensitivity, but uh, the linear range is smaller. You can also note that uh, here we have about 1% strain. So the strain that we apply on the strain gauge needs to be very small. We will need very sensitive circuits if we want to evaluate those very small changes of electrical resistance. So we are looking for resistance changes. Uh, the initial resistance of a strain gauge is typically 120 ohms and uh, this is specified for temperature 23 centigrades. So if you take an ohmmeter, you can immediately see if this is a strain gauge or if it is a temperature sensor. Because if you have a room temperature, let's say PT100, uh, for room temperature 23 centigrade, it will have something like 110 ohms. So you can immediately see that it's a strain gauge or if it's a temperature sensor. Uh, there are other types, typically 350 ohms and uh, 1000 ohms, but uh, the most common one is the 120 ohm. 
strain gauge. Uh, what is very critical is uh, that we have temperature compensation. So if you do not compensate the strain gauge for temperature effects, it will not work as a strain gauge. It will work as a temperature sensor and you will measure variations in temperature but not variations in strain. The variations in strain, they will have a very small effect, so we need to very carefully compensate for all other effects. Here I have an example so that you see uh, that temperature compensation is very crucial. Let's say uh, we have uh, a steel bar. The steel bar has a cross section of one square centimeter and we will apply a force of 1000 Newton. So let's say roughly we will hang uh, 100 kilograms on this steel bar. We will calculate what will be the change of resistance caused by the strain and by the change of temperature. We will consider two strain gauges. Gauge one will be made from constantan. This is the temperature coefficient of resistance. And the second strain gauge is from copper. Copper strain gauges are obviously not used because they would be very good temperature sensors but not strain gauges. Uh, I want to show it here because we will see that there will be a huge difference between the constantan strain gauge and between the other materials. You can see directly here uh, the, gate, the temperature coefficient of resistance for copper is uh, three orders of magnitude larger than this. So even that here we will see that it, the temperature will have an effect here will be like 1000 times bigger. So first of all uh, let us calculate what is uh, the tension and strain caused by the force. So those calculations are clear. Uh, here uh, Young's modulus I have chosen 200 gigapascal and we can see that the strain that we applied is 50 times 10 to the power of minus 6 is also called 50 micro strain. So the strain that we apply with this small force is very, very small. The change of length will be invisible. And when we calculate the relative change of uh, electrical resistance, then we will see that uh, it's this value, 0 0.1 times 10 to minus 3. Um, this is the relative change. Uh, in this calculation, I have considered that the gauge factor for constantan and copper is the same. In fact, it's not, but uh, the difference is very small. Constantan has a gauge factor of roughly 2 and uh, copper has roughly 2.6. So it's not entirely correct but uh, this allows us to compare the resistance. So now we have the relative ch resistance change. In the absolute value, uh, this would correspond to about 12 milli ohms. So we have initially 120 ohms and the change caused by the strain is just 12 milli ohms. So it's very small. Uh, the circuit that is used for bridges is uh, for, for strain gauges is uh, called a bridge and we will use here as an example one quarter bridge and uh, the output voltage you see will be just 300 microvolts so it's a very small voltage and uh, it would be difficult to transfer it to larger distances so the force that we have here 100 kilograms 1000 newton has created a signal of just 300 microvolts now what, we ha what will happen if uh, there will be a temperature change? So let's say we have the same beam, the sun starts shining on the beam and the temperature will change just by 10 centigrades. If you calculate the result, you will see that the constant strain gauge will change its resistance by about 10 milliohms. Remember here that we have, we have 12 milliohms of resistance change caused by the force and now we have about 10 milliohms by temperature change 
so it's about the same value. And for the coupled strain gauge, you see it, we would have 4.7 ohms. So the change of resistance caused by temperature would completely mask out the change caused by the force. So this is the reason why here we will use constantan and even if we use constantan strain gauge uh, we need to take measures to compensate the temperature changes. If we do not do that uh, we will have this effect which uh, will act like if we add additional 1000 Newton to the to the load cell or to the beam. Okay, now very briefly something about semiconductor strain gauges. Uh, semiconductor strain gauges have much higher sensitivity than uh, metallic strain gauges. They are made from uh, semiconductor material, different type, and uh, a semiconductor strain gauge uh, typically looks like this. You will see it's a very small piece of semiconductor material and we place this strain gauge directly in the application. Uh, either it comes like this as a single strain gauge or it comes also with the backing material. That depends on what you need. Uh, anyway, the sensitivity is much larger. The typical sensitivity for a semiconductor strain gauge is uh, larger than 100. So the gauge factor is uh, typically 100, 125. And it's about 25 times higher sensitivity than wire or foil strain gauges. On the other hand, if you look on the dependence between strain and temperature, it is non-linear, as we will see on the following page. And uh, also the dependence between temperature and resistance is nonlinear. And the sensitivity for temperature changes is at least 75 times higher than in the case of a metallic strain gauge. So here the semiconductor strain gauges are good for applications where you know that the temperature will not change at all and uh, in applications where you need this high sensitivity. This high sensitivity, in other words, will also mean that uh, we will use different circuits for metallic strain gauges and uh, for semiconductor strain gauges. The change of electrical resistance for a semiconductor strain gauge is very large, so we can typically measure it directly with an ohmmeter. You cannot use an ohmmeter in case of a metallic strain gauge. So in a metallic strain gauge, we will need bridges. In a semiconductor strain gauges, we can do it directly. This is just an example of uh, how the dependence between strain and resistance and temperature and resistance looks like. So here we see that strain and resistance it's a nonlinear function and those constants C1 and C2 you need to get them from the manufacturer. Uh, the same happens also for the temperature so here you have constants A and B and again it's a nonlinear dependence. Here you see some examples of uh, semiconductor strain gauges uh, so this is the one without any backing material and this is just an example of dimensions, so it can be very small. You see 0.1 millimeter thickness, this can be from 0.1 millimeter to 1 millimeter. Uh, so it's a very small strain gauge compared to the metallic strain gauges. Uh, this is an example where you have the strain gauge including the back backing material. In all cases the procedure is the same. Uh, you need to use special glues to glue the strain gauge to the surface. I have some example here. So this is a weight that is using strain gauges. Here I can zero the strain gauge. Uh, the, the we will see that 
it's very sensitive. It's possible if you compensate for all the effects like temperature, bending, and other problems to measure very accurately. So, for example, here I have um, two kilograms, and uh, we should see that it's showing us uh, so, uh, this is one kilogram, so 1002, this is in grams. And here I have a small weight of one gram. So if I add it to the weight, we should see that it increases by one gram. If you make it properly, we'll see that it's independent of the position. So we'll discuss also ways how uh, this load cell can be done and how we can compensate for the torques that uh, are created in this application. You will have a chance to, to play with this weight in the lab class. So there are strain gauges and uh, it's connected to circuits that uh, evaluate this very small change of electrical resistance. And this circuit is a bridge connection. So, this is the first connection. It's called a one-quarter bridge, and a one-quarter bridge is using one sensor. And one sensor is measuring what you want. In our case, it's the strain. And here, we will have uh, a second sensor that will compensate for temperature changes. So, from the measurement point of view, this is a one-quarter bridge because we are using one sensor only. But from the electrical point of view, it's a one-half bridge because we are using two strain gauges. The bridge connection typically is made in such a way that you have the initial resistance in the bridge the same. So let's say if this would be a 120 ohm strain gauge, then R0 would be 120. Here I have placed the strain gauge in this position and this is dependent on strain. So this is the strain gauge placed on some object and th this measures the, the strain. Uh, this RC is the second strain gauge that is used for temperature compensation. And we have to place it in the application in such a way that uh, it has the same temperature, but is that it does not measure uh, this strain as this strain gauge. We'll see a little bit later how to do this. The other resistors in this case are in the electronic circuit in the bridge, and uh, they are fixed. We can have two ways uh, how we evaluate the signal from this bridge, the signal on the output is this voltage V0. And uh, if we measure the voltage directly, it's called an unbalanced bridge. An unbalanced bridge means that we are not changing anything here in this setting and we are just reading the voltage on the bridge output. Uh, we will not go directly into uh, the uh, calculation, but uh, this equation is important. Uh, it's called an equation of balance. So it means that when this equation is fulfilled, the output voltage here is zero. And this would be the case of the balance bridge. So uh, here this would be R1, R2, R3 and R4. Uh, both ways are used, balance and unbalanced bridges. Balanced bridges, you need to change the setting. So you need to adjust the values of the resistances until you have zero output voltage, and then you read the setting. Uh, so this takes longer. It's typically used in labs. Uh, but uh, it has one huge advantage. And this advantage is that you are looking for zero. It's a single value. So you don't care about the linearity of your connection. If you use an unbalanced connection, if you measure directly the voltage V0 on, on the bridge, you will find out that this voltage does not depend in a linear way on the change of the resistance that you have on the bridge. 
In other words, uh, the v0 is a nonlinear function of uh, delta r. So even if you have a nice s linear strain gauge, by using a nonlinear connection like this unbalanced bridge, you will get a nonlinear response. So, uh, for more accurate applications, uh, you want uh, to use the balance bridge, and this means that those resistors need to be variable. Uh, now, this one quarter bridge has some sensitivity. The sensitivity in this case means how much is the voltage changing by the change of this resistance. And let's say the sensitivity of one quarter bridge is one, without any unit. We will compare all other connections to this one quarter bridge. So it has some sensitivity. Now if I want to increase the sensitivity, I can use two strain gauges. And two strain gauges means that two strain gauges will measure what I have applied, so compression or tension, and two other strain gauges will be used to compensate for temperature changes. So from measurement point of view, I'm using two sensors, but from electrical point of view, I'm using all four resistors. So uh, from electrical point of view, this is a full bridge, but from measurement point of view, this is a, a one-half bridge. Now in this case, when you are using two sensors, you have two options. And this depends on the placement on the load cell or on the beam that you are using. Uh, one option is that both of your strain gauges uh, measure in the same direction. For example, uh, if I have a beam, I install the strain gauges in such a way that they both measure tension or both measure compression. This is shown here. And if you remember the condition of balance, we had R1 times R4 on one side of the equation, that's here, and on the second side of the equation we had R2 and R3. So if I have two strain gauges that go into the same direction, I need to place them on the same side of the equation of balance. So it means that here this is one strain gauge and this is a second strain gauge. And the two compensating strain gauges needs to be placed on the second side of the equation. So if I have some changes with temperature, they will compensate the resistance change and we will not see an effect here on the output of the bridge. The second possibility is that you have two sensors but they both measure in the opposite direction. For example, if you have a beam, you place the strain gauge, one on top of the beam, one on the bottom of the beam, so one will measure compression and one will measure tension. In this case, you need to use a different connection, which is also a, a half bridge, but you see that here now the strain gauges are placed in those positions. And one is increasing resistance with increasing strain, and the other one is decreasing resistance with increasing strain. And the two remaining resistors are, again, strain gauges, but they are used for temperature compensation. In this case, in the case of the one-half bridge, since we are using all four resistors in the connection, it will be always an unbalanced bridge. So we don't have any elements in the connection that will allow us to balance the bridge. If we compare the sensitivity of uh, a one-half bridge to a one-quarter bridge, we will see that the sensitivity has doubled. We have doubled, doubled the number of sensors, but we have doubled also the sensitivity. So we have a larger change of the voltage with the input strain. Strain gauges are not that expensive. Uh, one strain gauge is roughly, let's say, 100 check rounds. So uh, we can easily apply two or four to a load cell and uh, increase the sensitivity. You can see here that we are already using four strain gauges. So why not to use a strain, four strain gauges and 
use them directly to measure the effects of the force. And this is the full bridge connection. So a full bridge connection is using four strain gauges and they are all used to measure the effects of strain. In this case we do not have any strain gauges for temperature compensation but it's not important because if we install the strain gauges correctly it will be automatically compensated for temperature changes. But note here that in this case we need two strain gauges that measure in one direction and two other strain gauges that measure in the opposite direction. So we need to have enough space in our application so that we can have two strain gauges for compression and two strain gauges for tension. Again, this is an unbalanced bridge. We measure directly the voltage here on the output of the bridge. In all cases, the bridge needs a power supply. So this is the power supply, which has an internal resistance. But uh, in the calculations, we typically neglect this internal resistance. Uh, this is uh, typically much smaller than the value we have in, in the strain gauges. So this is 120 ohms, roughly. This can be like 1 ohm, for example. So in the calculations, we are typically neglecting that. Now, if you compare the full bridge with all the other connections, you'll find out that a full bridge has four times sensitivity compared to one quarter bridge and two times sensitivity compared to one half bridge. So, if I have place only for one sensor, I will use one quarter bridge. I need temperature compensation. If I want high sensitivity, I can use uh, the full bridge connection if I have enough space in the application. Um, typically, all waiting applications are using full bridges. So, it is this connection you use four strain gauges installed somehow on the load cell and you have high sensitivity and the temperature effects are automatically compensated. Now, uh, this is just to give you an idea about the changes of resistance that we have uh, in strain gauge applications. So, uh, it's an example of a beam, a full bridge, you see four strain gauges, two measure compression, two measure tension, and uh, this is calculated for the 350 ohms strain gauge. Uh, the power supply typically is 5 to 12 volts and uh, this is the output voltage. So even if you have um, a full bridge connection, this voltage on the output is a few millivolts. So you need a DC amplifier uh, to, to yeah, amplify the voltage. If you would transfer this voltage to a larger distance, you would pick up some noise and that can cause you trouble. Uh, you cannot increase the voltage to much higher levels uh, because the increasing the voltage means that you are also increasing the current in uh, the strain gauges. And uh, too high current would cause you self-heating of the strain gauge and uh, we want to compensate all the changes of temperature. Some questions so far? Okay. So, now let's talk a little bit about how to place the strain gauges in our application. We are placing the strain gauges on load cells or directly on the object. The load cell uh, typically has a shape of a beam or some other shape and uh, we want to compensate all the effects of temperature and torques that we do not want to measure. This is an example how you should place the strain gauges in a full bridge connection if you want to measure axial force. So let's say we have a beam here and I want to measure this force and I want to compensate for the bending force for eventual torque and of course I want to compensate for temperature changes. 
Here you see what is the arrangement of resistors in the bridge. So R1, R2, R3, R4. So if you take a look on this picture, you see that R1 and R2 are oriented in this direction. So they measure the axial force. Now, if I apply axial force, we, they will both measure tension. If I apply bending force, this will measure tension and this will measure compression. But if we write the equation of balance for our bridge, which is R1 times R4 equals R2 times R3, we see that the force FB in R1, let's say, has increased the resistance. So there is an increase here. But in R4, we have a decrease and we are taking into account that this is the same value. So we have added something here and we have subtracted something from R4. So the bridge will stay in balance. So force FB will not have an effect on the bridge output voltage. The same will happen also for torque. So for torque, uh, we use R2 and R3. So there will be a change in R2 and R3 as well, but they will both go into different directions. So let's say R2 will be increasing, R3 will be decreasing, and it will cancel, and the bridge will stay balanced. The same will happen for temperature. So uh, we need to install the strain gauges in such a way that uh, they are very, cl very close to each other and that they have the same temperature. In this case, let's say I will be increasing temperature, but I will increase temperature in the same way for all four resistors in the bridge, and this will not have an effect on the bridge output voltage. So this full bridge connection automatically compensates for all those uh, sources, like bending force, torque, and temperature, and it automatically measures the axial force. If you want to measure the bending force, then uh, you need to install the strain gauges in a different way. So here you see that's the beam. I want to compensate for axial forces, but I want to measure the bending force. So here we have the four strain gauges installed along the axis. And uh, if I apply FA, I will add some resistance to the the strain gauge, but it will be compensated. If I apply FB, then R1 and R4 are here on the same side. They will measure tension, and uh, R2 and R3 will measure compression, so uh, the resistance will decrease, and we will have a larger sensitivity because this will become unbalanced and we will be able to measure the voltage. Temperature compensation um, is automatically here because it's a full bridge connection. Uh, this is a typical arrangement in um, applications like this. So basically this is the case that you see here. Uh, this is uh, a load cell that is attached on one side here and by applying the weight I'm bending the beam and the strain gauges are uh, placed here in this opening. So from top and from the bottom there are strain gauges in this arrangement. And the last thing uh, will be how we can apply this to measure torque. So uh, if you want to measure torque you need to install the strain gauges under the angle 45 degrees to the axis because it is this direction where you will find the main stresses. So we have a full bridge connection, it's a shaft, and uh, we have two strain gauges on one side, two strain gauges on the other side. The angle between those two strain gauges is 90 degrees. So this is an ideal case where you can use a strain gauge rosette, or you can use uh, a strain gauge four times, but you need to maintain uh, the angle 90 degrees yourselves. 
Uh, again, this compensates for bending force, for axial force, and of course for temperature. So now let's take a look on some applications. Strain gauges are typically installed on load cells and load cells are in applications like this, like weighting applications, and we use them to measure forces on, on the beams. Uh, there are several types of load cells. We'll discuss just, I think, uh, let me see, just three of them. Uh, different load cells are used in different ranges. Uh, what you see here, the S-type load cell, is uh, some, somewhere in the middle range. So it's not for really large forces, but not for very small forces. How does it work? Here, you see the shape, S-type load cell, letter S, and uh, the strain gauges are placed here in the middle of the load cell. When I apply force, there will be a deformation and we will measure this deformation uh, in the load cell. Now this area here and this area here helps us to protect the load cell against overload. If the force is too high, this part will beam entirely and when it touches this other part, the stiffness will increase and uh, we will not destroy the load cell. So this is protection. Uh, you see here we have four strain gauges. The strain gauges are typically sealed in a cavity because they are uh, quite sensitive to moisture. And uh, this is the cover. It's typically welded and the strain gauges are uh, also hidden under uh, a layer of uh, protective material. Um, and here you see we have a terminal connector and we just have a cable output. So we cannot access the strain gauges anymore <laughs> when this is manufactured. Now on this connection, uh, you can see the bridge connection and you maybe see that there are more wires than just four of them. Uh, in theory, we would need just four wires for the bridge because that's all it takes. But uh, we want also to compensate for the effects of the connecting wires between the load cell and between the electronics, which can be like one meter, can be five meters. But uh, in all cases, the resistance of the connecting wires uh, will have a large effect on uh, the output. So this is the reason why here we are typically using a six wire connection. So four wires are used to, uh, so two wires are used to uh, measure the output voltage. Two wires are used to provide current to the bridge and two wires are used to measure the voltage that we have at the bridge as a power supply. So then uh, we can have the sensitivity directly written on the bridge saying how sensitive the bridge is compared to some power supply voltage. So for example, uh, on a bridge then you typically find something like this, uh, like millivolts per volt. And this means that the bridge output voltage will be some voltage, small voltage, and it's related to the power supply voltage. So this allows you to, to say, okay, if I use my bridge for 5 volts, I will have smaller sensitivity than if I use it for 12 volts. But on the other hand, if you use a larger voltage, it means that you will have larger current and you may have a problem with self-heating of the strain gauges. The second type of load cell is the beam load cell. This is exactly what you see here. So it's a beam that is fixed on one side and uh, the platform typically is attached to the other side of the beam. So if I apply some load here, the beam is bending like this and I measure this bending. Um, in this case, the strain gauges are placed from the top of the load cell and from the bottom of the load cell. So uh, they are placed here in this cavity, so 
on top there are strain gauges and on the bottom there are strain gauges. In the case of this application, uh, it's visible, but typically in uh, weights you will find that this is welded. Again, we need some protection against moisture. So in this case, this would be the area where you connect the platform. Uh, in this position, you would connect some frame uh, and the beam will bend downwards here with the applied weight. Uh, the beam load cells are typically uh, used for smaller weights or smaller forces uh, compared to the S-type load cells. Although not exclusively, uh, this is used typically for smaller forces. And this, the last type is uh, the compression load cell. The compression load cell uses only compression. So internally, it's uh, a vertical piece of material and the strain gauges are oriented here in this vertical direction. So strain gauges would be placed like this. If I apply force, I will apply compression to the material and uh, therefore those compression load cells are typically used for larger forces. If you want to weight a train or a plane, you would you probably use this compression type load cell. I have some examples of uh, applications. So we can do strain analysis with strain gauges. Um, on rails, so here you see example of rails, example of strain gauges. Um, you can see automotive components like shafts, um, different pins, so here you see different strain gauges. Uh, this allows you to typically verify the calculations or some finite element models uh, with the, an experiment. This is a, an example of, uh, of a bike, uh, here you see installed strain gauges in multiple directions so here from the side from top from the other side and they use it to install uh, to, to verify the, the stresses some other applications like ball bearings so here you see uh, the ball bearing equipped with strain gauges you see shaft you can see um, some some box for transmission and so on um, the signal can also be transferred by radio waves. So here you see an example of a torque sensor, strain gauges here and the same rosette from the other side. And this is the bridge connection including the RF transmitter. So then when this shaft is moving you can get still the data. Another example, blades for a turbine, strain gauges installed uh, on the tips here and some cables connecting them to, that, to the virus transmitter. Uh, you are not limited to metallic materials only, so this is an example of strain gauges placed on uh, a composite material. This is a carbon composite material. Typical applications are waiting machines so in a kitchen for example if you take apart a kitchen weight it looks typically like this so it's the beam type load cell uh, we will see an example on the lab class or another example this is also a weight uh, and if you look here there is a beam and uh, when you stand on that here the, the beam is fixed on this side and the platform is fixed on the, on this side so if it shows you uh, if you ca still can add uh, some weight or, or not. Um, some other applications that I have found interesting here you see monitoring of pipes uh, in a hydropower plant um, so you see installed strain gauges and uh, those are the covered strain gauges, protection from moisture again. Uh, another application is uh, residual stress monitoring. So uh, if you have a surface that has been heat treated, 
you can measure the residual strat. You place that on top of the material uh, and you drill a hole with a defined speed in the defined depth and then this releases the stress into the strain gauge and you can measure it. Of course, you can do it only once. You cannot repeat that. But it, this is a way how you can get residual stresses. And the uh, last interesting application, um, when you change something in a plane, like you change the carpets, you change installations, you need to balance the plane again. So uh, this is an example, uh, weights under the wheels, they measure how much is the weight of the plane, if it's evenly distributed and if they should change something to balance the plane correctly. Uh, we'll take a look on a nice video how truck scales are made. You will see the strain gauge manufacturing process from the very beginning. So how the individual strain gauge is produced and then how it's installed in such a large application. So let me find the video. Yeah. Seems to be some problem with internet access. Okay, so I'll um, for some reason, I'm not able to connect to the internet. I'll leave it running to see if it will be fine. Um, we'll continue a little bit and then I'll try to come back. So, uh, the last thing is how do we select a strain gauge? Um, there are many criteria and one of them is uh, if we know something about the application. Uh, it means that uh, we need to know something about the direction of the stress that we want to measure. If we don't know this, uh, we have to use a strain gauge rosette and a strain gauge rosette will help us to get the direction of the main stress. So this is a strain gauge rosette with 120 degrees. If I know the directions of the stresses, then uh, we can use uh, a strain gauge rosette with 90 degrees. And we orient the rosette in such a way that we measure directly the main stresses. Uh, if we want to measure single axial strain, then we can use just the strain gauge itself. Uh, so this is the geometric selection. Uh, the second criteria may be if we are limited in dimensions. So if we are limited in dimensions, then that's the most important thing. And we should select the size of the strain gauge based on our available dimensions. There are different uh, sizes of uh, strain gauges. The ones I showed you are the most common ones and uh, the size is let's say 5 by 15 millimeters roughly but of course there are smaller strain gauges or even larger strain gauges so if you are limited in size you can have smaller strain gauges than I showed you 
Uh, one factor that is also very important is what material do I measure? If the material has uh, a uniform structure in the entire cross-section or if it has not. So uh, if you have this kind of material that has uniform structure, then uh, the length is determined by the strain field that you want to measure. In other words, uh, the strain gauge measures the strain along its whole length. So for example, if uh, you have a material that looks like this, that has different grains with different properties, then you should select a longer strain gauge because this will uh, give you a better estimate of the average. So uh, you should select the grid length to be at least five times larger than the inhomogeneity size, the particle size that you have. So for example, if this would be uh, some mixture of two materials, you have to select a larger strain gauge. If you do this, this would be incorrect because here you don't know what do you measure. Do I measure uh, the strain in this material or in the other material? So the length of the strain gauge will give us an average. Uh, of course, if you are limited by length or weight, you have to select what will fit and you have an example like this, uh, a shaft with a small notch here and the size will limit me, the size of the strain gauge. Uh, by the way, this is a good example where you may use the semiconductor strain gauges because they are significantly smaller compared to all the metallic strain gauges. Questions? Okay, so the last topic for today is torque sensors. As we have already seen, if I install the strain gauges correctly, I can measure torque, so I can build a torque sensor. So a torque sensor would be equipped with four strain gauges at least, and uh, they are arranged under 45 degrees along the axis. We compensate for temperature, for bending, for axial forces. And the only question is, how do I get the signal out from the bridge or how do I get the power into the bridge? So typically, uh, we are using uh, a kind of transformer to power the bridge through inductive coupling. So uh, there is a winding around this part of the shaft which transfers the power as a transformer into the rotor. Here uh, we have uh, a pulse to DC converter which uh, is like a rectifier. So you use a relatively high frequency here uh, to improve the efficiency. And here you have a DC power supply. You use it for the bridge then the bridge gives you a signal and you need to get the signal out to some unit. So uh, you can do a wireless transfer, for example, uh, or you can again transfer the DC voltage to pulses and you can transfer them to, through capacitive coupling or through inductive coupling with some other winding. So uh, this is how it's done in torque sensors that they typically typically look like this. So then the rotating part connect that to your between the motor and between between the load and inside uh, we have the strain gauges and uh, we have some way how the data is transferred from the rotating part to the stator. Uh, torque sensors are typically very expensive uh, this sensor is about 8,000 euros, so it's quite quite expensive. Uh, you can see uh, the price roughly. Uh, there is a huge difference between sensors for 
fixed applications and for rotary applications. So for fixed applications, it's not that bad. Fixed applications means there's no rotational movement, um, but uh, you have a flange and you connect it between the load and the source of the torque. Uh, rotary applications are typically more expensive, like 10 times at least. And uh, here you see an example of a torque sensor. Uh, it's using the same principle here. You connect the shaft between the load and the, and the motor, and it's using some way of data transmission, either wireless or the inductive or capacitive coupling. Uh, some examples. So um, in our labs, you may see applications like this. So uh, induction motor, torque sensor, and some form of load. Um, this is quite interesting a sensor for 1.5 mega newton meters used to measure torques in uh, ships so can measure even, even very large torques now let me try the video if it works <coughs> seems to be working so i just will find the Okay, so let's let's see.
to build the base of the way bridge, they lay out a grid of thick steel tubes and cross beams. Workers lower a guide to help them align the parts perfectly. Beneath each load cell is a pin. In order to weigh accurately, a load cell has to be level. So it's critical to make sure this pin is level before welding on the bulkhead that holds it. Once fully welded, the way bridge is assembled and ready for painting. The paint equipment laces the powdered paint with a positive electrical charge and the way bridge with a negative one. This evenly draws the paint particles onto the steel like a magnet. In another department, they assemble the steel stand on which the load cell will sit. A welder tacks the pieces together, then a robot does the full welding. Now that all the parts are ready, final assembly of the truck scale can begin. The way bridge, right side up now, contains eight load cells at different locations. The first step is to install each load cell stand into its respective position. They insert a link on each side of the stand. They position the load cell at the top of the links. And the bulkhead pin at the bottom. with an access plate. The last step is to calibrate the scale. They lay a 10,000 pound weight, that's more than 4,500 kilos, on different parts of the scale to check if the digital readout is accurate. It takes a lot of time to get a truck scale just right, but it's definitely worth the wait. Okay, questions? Fine.